Hi, today is July 25th, 2024, and here are my poems for the day. The first one is poem number 1147 for the year, Family Tea Blenders. On the way to New Haven on Tuesday, I saw the writing on the wall of the Bigelow Warehouse on Black Rock Turnpike in Fairfield, Connecticut. It said, Family Tea Blenders since 1945, and I know they mean that the family has been making the tea since 1945, but when I see the word family, I always think rated G, and it got me wondering about NC-17 tea, lurid and graphic and pornographic tea, hot tea, Dirty, filthy, disgusting tea. Tea that you ought to be ashamed of. Tea that after you drink it, you have to take two showers because it's that dirty. The tea, the kind of tea you would never find at the Bigelow Warehouse in Fairfield because they are family tea blenders and they have been for nearly 80 years and they're not about to change now. You probably have to go back to New York for that kind of tea. Poem number 1148, Dirty Tea. Come and drink this dirty tea with me, made from the finest, filthiest tea leaves in Nepal, processed under the most prurient conditions with the rich, full-bodied taste of granny's orgasms, brewed using an agonizingly laborious and lecherous slow-drip method and served in cups that more than once were filled with Perhaps it's best if you don't know what was once in these cups. But please, let us sit by the obscene fire and drink this dirty tea together, and then maybe watch Mary Poppins. Poem number 1149, Suburban Life. There was a lot of money piling up in the backyard, and she finally went and got the rake and raked the money into piles, and having done that, she was unable to resist the urge to dive into one of the stacks of cash and roll around in it, making a mess of the money. Then she took up the rake once more and arranged the greenbacks into neat, even neater piles. She then transferred the piles into black bags and brought each bag to the mulching machine. It was a pain in the ass each autumn when the backyard would get inundated, but by now she knew how to take care of her charming property in the suburbs. Poem number 1150, Object Analysis. After obtaining an advanced doctorate degree, they were ready to analyze not just human beings, but geometrical objects as well. Their first client was a cube who at first was hesitant to even lie on the couch, but eventually the cube told them its deepest secrets and family traumas, its sexual and psychosexual history, and even all about the pettiest of squabbles that the cube was having at the office. The analysis was successful, and after a mere four months, the cube felt fully integrated and thanked the doctor profusely. Soon, they had more clients than they could handle. Triangles, hexagons, trapezoids, a couple of lines, and fortunately, only one dots. Dots were a real puzzle to them. They became an expert in object analysis, writing books, giving guest lectures at many un major universities at home and abroad. If they come to your town, you ought to check them out. And if you happen to be an object in need of therapy, I can't recommend them more highly. And the last poem of the day, poem number 1151, Cocks in Bloom. Each spring, when the cocks are in bloom, a handful of mischievous university students will jump the fence and sneak into the botanical gardens and collect up bouquets of cocks to give as gifts to their lovers. Occasionally, complaints are made to the dean, but like bamboo, cocks are sustainable. They are easily regenerated after harvesting. Life is abundance. There are plenty of cocks to go around, perhaps far more than you could ever want. So I say when the cocks are in bloom, let the college kids have their fun. They're not hurting anybody. All right, that's it. Thank you. I appreciate you.